Um, welcome back. Uh, my name is Tianlong Jiao. I am the Joseph de Heer Curator of Asian Art at this museum. Um, Dr. Chen Xi and I will team up for this last section of this long day. And I really appreciate everybody um, uh, coming to um, join us for this um, very important discussion. Um, what uh, Dr. Chen and I will focus on is on China, but we will put China in a global context, that is the globalization of Chinese art over the long history of China, of China as well as uh, what is going on uh, in the Chinese art world today, uh, the sort of ongoing process of the Chinese art. But more importantly, as a museum curator, um, um, particularly uh, in the museum, both Dr. Chen and I work, uh, the Royal Tyrone Museum as, and Danfar Art Museum. Both of us are global art museums, or global art and cultural museums. How can a museum exhibit, or how, how the museum um, curators deal with this uh, globalization um, of the Chinese art, both historically and from the contemporary uh, perspective? Uh, it is a very well-known fact um, from archaeology, history, or art history, that China has been uh, closely connected with many regions in Asia and the world through all kinds of mechanisms, through trade, immigration, religion, and culture. So one of the consequences of this connectedness is the constant changes of art uh, in China. And with the globalization, uh, it become a global phenomenon. So how are we going to deal with that? So this is the, uh, the topic we want to uh, investigate. I will present some of the practice we did in both, you know, in, in, in the museum he worked and also I worked here. Dr. Chen and I share a lot of background. Uh, we're both from China. He ended up as a Canadian Chinese, and I end up as an American Chinese here. So we ourselves uh, kind of manifestation of this globalization, or diaspora, if you want, um, uh, of the Chinese people as well as culture. And we both train as archaeologists, but we also have to, you know, we, now we all, we both have to deal with that the art, um, uh, contemporary art in China. So each of us um, uh, will, you will say, our, our presentation will reflect our um, uh, research background, as well as the uh, museum uh, that we are currently uh, work. Um, Dr. Chen has been uh, working at the Royal Ontario Museum for more than two decades. Uh, he uh, not only um, did fantastic uh, cutting edge uh, academic researches, but he also curated uh, many exhibits that examine both China and beyond China. And now he's in charge of the, the art and culture. Uh, his title is the vice president of uh, art and culture in that British museum. So um, our panel will start with uh, Dr. Chen uh, to give you a uh, perspective about the, um, uh, the practice in his museum. So please join me in welcome Dr. Chen. Thank you very much, Tianlong, and uh, it is my great pleasure to be here again in the Denver Art Museum, and uh, thanks John and, and all the colleagues from the Denver Art Museum for putting up these great symposiums. I had a great time this morning up, up to now, and I hope you had a wonderful time as much as I am, and uh, I hope uh, my presentation following will be joined to a different perspective when looking at the topics that we are addressing today. And first of all, uh, I'm coming from Canada, so I feel sorry that I bring the snow last night. <laughs> and so if it's caused any inconvenience, please blame Canada. So, And also, I uh, feel that I'm coming home. Uh, for some reason, you already see from these slides that uh, Royal Ontario Museum is Canada's premier museum of art and culture nature. And uh, we also had Daniel Limbiskin's Crystals edition in 2005. 
And uh, so welcome to the uh, Global Limbiskin Museum uh, world. And uh, my topic today is the uh, globalization. So first of all, um, I would uh, claim that at least my appropriation from the Google, um, Google images. So just for the record of that. And uh, <clears throat> just try to address globalization while we're talking. But globalization has a many contexts. Okay? We have to put it in the context of our museum here. So we're referring to a process of changes that results of people's migrations, economic interactions, ideal exchanges, technology transformations. At the end of our end is the cultural diffusions. So when people move, like Tenno and I, myself, and many other, yours among yourself, we care for where we came from, and the, they remember the place of oranges and the worship the oranges. They want to be, remain their identity and carry on the traditions when the people move from one place to another place. They came to museum for some with a purpose to find their roots and seek for their heritage, as many we told our you know, young, youngest to do so. But until one day in the conversation with them, you find out really they become us, and us is become they, and we are the one at being a globalization. But then people will ask a question, how they become us, how we become them, how we become us, or one, could they come to the museum to look for the answers? And I say yes, because the museum could make people to think of more about globalization, about cultural diffusions, those traditional thoughts that can make relevance of their lives to link the past to the present. And that is why is over, the, the, the reason for that, I'm saying, why it's that? The reasons for that is because over the last 100 years, museums have collected global art, have recognized global cultural, and have interpreted global art and the cultural. And works of art around the world came to form a museum primarily during the last you know, 100 years, and especially during the end of 18th century to early you know, 20th century during that time, line of time. And a museum is established as a result of a globalization process. And the works of art from a, a global come to the museum um, because of the uh, business interactions, collaborations from a continent to continent, the transportation make it easier, so people realize we need to see what exotic places, what exotic places represented by exotic uh, artworks that as seen in these black and white uh, photos as uh, what all the museum has experienced and we put as a treasure box in the display. But museums since then has been globalized. By that, I mean a museum grew to expand their collections to collect and uh, study, interpret other parts of the world. And uh, you know, they're building, the, uh, they established the galleries of different cultural regions, adding more and more to the museum. And we continue to do so even coming to today's we are working with communities and we're working building our collections of uh, cultural regions like Koreans and when we work in Korean communities. And, and, uh, the, and the museum also have globalized art. By that I mean it used to work of art for the purpose of educational, for the education and to interpret the cultural differentiation. Try to explain the ones uh, isolated, isolated audience of the, uh, of the museum and try to educate them that Asia, Africa, or indigenous, indigenous uh, American are not cultural backwaters as Western were perceived. And typically, 
the typical um, galleries, as it's seen in the middle of the, uh, uh, the pictures there. You see this is the, uh, the, the, the Rams galleries of China in the 1980s to uh, ed educate the how the China developed chronologically from prehistoric, prehistoric time to the end of the dynasty as well. So that it being becoming a norm of the museum practice over the last 100 years of uh, development to go along with that. And then through with the changes of audience dem that demographic and the prevent, uh, prevalence of uh, social media, the museum now have engaged in the global communities by global communities. I do not mean only the communities of uh, diversified ethnic groups, like Chinese communities, Korean communities, you know, black American communities, African American communities. We also mean communities that are different disciplinaries, business, government agencies, and the cultural institutes that share global interests that have issues to talk about. And uh, so that the last picture here is the Rams, new galleries of Chinese um, of China, built in 2005 when the new crystal was being built, and uh, to uh, employ the open concept of layout design, so no longer to ask people following the uh, 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 the roots of the uh, chronology and allowing free flows for the visitors who may have their own interest and the mandates for visitations. So those things, are very briefly, for things changed over time in the museum in terms of change of globalizations. But so we move towards the 21st century museum concept that is a museum as being a civic hub and the community-based public-facing institute, the globalization has considerable implications for the museum's strategic plan that affects the nature of the exhibition program learning uh, museum professions and practice. But simply put it, all the museums like the RAM and the Denver Art Museum is making a global impact becoming one of our mission today. Now in the past, we acknowledge the roles of Asian galleries, of Chinese galleries, in the dominance of Western museums, and we all end in the view of Western views. But today, and we needed to think about what kinds of Asian or Chinese galleries exhibitions program should be we seeking for, and what kinds of narratives should we imagine and tell in the context of globalization. And this is what we are facing as a curator uh, in the museums. As the museum starts to revitalize the new galleries of Asian art, there will be still very strong tendency. And that's, that's what we are facing the challenges as a museum curator, that is the communities and the museum's audience still want to see the segregated cultural representations by the regions and the countries like China, Korea, Japan, and the South Asia and Southwestern uh, Asia as a norm practice. As you see here, this is a, the low one. I don't know whether I can put it. Yeah, the low one is a, the new galleries of China in the British Museum. They just finished about two years ago. And they, uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, the RAM new Chinese galleries. Well, since change a lot inside these galleries, we rather break up the chronological lines, but we put a more global interest in the theme, but you can see they're still segregated from one to the others. And I will come back with that point in a few minutes. So, my uh, questions will come through those practices. When we really define a Chinese art or any art that we are working with in the museums, what is the boundaries in today's view, in today's perspectives of Chinese art? And it should be there as one. What does the global art mean to the curators and what does that term mean to our audience, visitors to have different definitions that we define in the museums as, as curators? What does it mean by globalizing Chinese art in the gallery interpretations and the displaying in the context of art, uh, world art and the cultural. And how does this view so would affect our curatorial jobs today in our museum? So those are the questions I'll raise for the future discussions. By no means I would be able to provide some answers at the end of my talk. 
However, what I'd like to do, I'm going to throw out my uh, scripts right now, to tell you a few stories that I have been working in the museum, mostly from the recent years, you know, stay away from my traditional practice in, uh, before, that uh, to, uh, to, to, to serve as a few case studies that may be centered for a few, uh, the three areas of questions. Whose art is it? And uh, whose story is it? And, uh, who's, and, uh, and how those stories being told? Who tells those stories and who owns the past? Oh, there is. So now I'm going to look at the pictures and tell a few stories before I'm going to throw up out my uh, last points. Uh, look at my scripts here. So a few years back, I uh, put up the uh, exhibitions, a uh, major exhibitions in Rome is the uh, the Forbidden City inside the court of uh, uh, China's emperors. And the, uh, so we uh, borrowed 250 objects from the uh, Beijing Palace Museum, which wants to be the Forbidden City. All the treasures there is as, uh, treated as a national uh, treasures we brought here as a norm, and we bring stories about tenant life inside the court, rather than just a grandeur of uh, ceremonials, objects, and big stuff. And uh, this is uh, one of the sections that I put up. And uh, oh, that you see, you all see these familiars, right? As uh, Daniel Limbiskin's uh, uh, designs of the galleries with the till the walls, put the, my labels in, uh, in a way of that you have to uh, kill your necks to read them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, so these sections that I put in as called, um, I forgot the real name, it's a phony inference. It's the uh, objects that uh, the Chinese emperors in the Forbidden City received as a gift from the foreign missionaries. And the UC is uh, what what try to, the point that I try to make in this section is, is the China emperors in the uh, 17th and 18th century they are fascinating about those uh, new technology the you know the uh, the cannon the guns the uh, telescopes and uh, 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 instruments and uh, and the clocks like this and they treat as they are all and the toys and they 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 uh, they don't put a clock one in the room uh, one, only one in the room they put hundreds of them in one rooms to decorate it and they are you know um, modified into a Chinese uh, Chinese uh, uh, anyway Chinese uh, uh, a style to make it into a Chinese um, part and this is for artworks was for in in that sections. And you see one of these emperors who uh, has Western costumes being portrayed by uh, uh, Western techniques in the, uh, in the oil cam on the canvas. And the interesting one is in the middle, uh, it's a painting. And uh, I just get the names right. And, and, and a painting of the horses. This is the one of the 10 uh, horses in the album says, and regarded as uh, national treasures because it's one of the kind. And, uh, um, many Chinese uh, students, I always say Chinese students, most Chinese students recognize the Chinese name and never thought about the, art, the, uh, the, the, the artist is a French um, uh, missionary, uh, Jean, Jean Denis Atteré, and uh, he is served, king, uh, served the uh, emperors to draw these um, paintings. And of course, the paintings has been uh, supplemented by uh, beautiful calligraphies by very famous Chinese uh, literati and uh, been uh, known for uh, for the art world. And these paintings certainly uh, been treasured as a um, masterpieces of Chinese art. But really, how many people know the pen painter is the friend? It's the same case as for the next one um, on, my, on the right. It's uh, by a French Jesuit missionary. And very, of course, for this one, it's very famous because he's being most promo, uh, promoted in China, being a, uh, a foreign painter from Italy and uh, Castonia, um, Castonia. And, uh, and of course, his, uh, his paintings and drawing on his very, very particular vase that made uh, his works very famous throughout uh, in the imperial time period. And uh, so this is really seeing, you know, if the paintings that is uh, painted by a, uh, uh, a artist who has uh, nationalities that whether you can define as Chinese or non-Chinese. I'll come back with the point later, but I just 
for now, save us for now. And uh, during uh, my interaction with the uh, Palace Museum, I discovered something is fascinating, and uh, I assume that not many people found that is of uh, interest. So a curator uh, somehow in the conversation that told me um, Palace Museum has a collection of more than 300 objects from Russia, the Russians called from the Hermitage from the, uh, St. Petersburg. And, a one, and a most of them are still you know, stayed in storage, they're never been sectioned, they never had been displayed and studied. And I found it fascinating because I encountered with this uh, lady uh, um, on the back, and uh, she is the new hire by the Paris Museum as a curator of a Russian art in Chinese museum. It is just a fascinating to find a fact that in a very traditional Chinese, uh, you know, uh, uh, a very nationalist Chinese uh, art museum, or not really called a you know, cultural museum, and hire a curators of uh, Russian art who, uh, really interesting is that she's not the art historian in the Russian art in China. She's just a very fluent with the Russian language. And of course, I studied her PhDs and post, uh, postdoctors uh, fellows in the areas of uh, Russian art. And uh, but she is able to bridge in that uh, communications with Hermitage that uh, during that communications and Hermitage raised the awareness that there is their art in Beijing, and that come to a result of that. And um, I show that picture, Brand the White picture. That is the Prince of Art Tomsky, and very famous uh, figures in the Russian uh, histories, associated with the Tsar Nicholas II, and for their grand tour to the East. And uh, he uh, presented the gifts of the more than 100 pieces in the past museum, still in the storage. And here his uh, great grandsons come to Beijing to check them out. Okay. So that is a fascinating thing. And the second thing that I find from this uh, exchange is that a crane a shaped of the uh, candle holders uh, was a gift from the Guangxi Empress, the Empress in the end of the uh, 19th century to the Russian court the Hermitage. It is now in the collection of the Hermitage. And uh, even though I found it very interesting to see the fevers of Chinese cultural and the court lives in the Hermitage on the China in their imagination, it's kind of a little bizarre uh, areas of in their imaginations. But I wanted to, 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 to point out another strange bizarre thing in my own museum is the other two cranes seen in my storage, the one I put in the galleries, somewhere it's not in the galleries of Japan, not in the gallery of China, not in the gallery in the Korea. Why? Because none of the curators from this three country acknowledge their, it is theirs. <laughs> the Chinese curators say, no, it's not Chinese. The Korean curators come here and say, no, it's not Korean. So uh, I'm still exploring, you know, even though I pretty much convinced myself it is Chinese, but hey, who, who do I care? Really, this gave me the question, say, do you really care? <laughs> is it Chinese or Korean? Or, or, uh, Korean? No, seriously, I, I, I still struggle myself it is for these bothering questions. Do you really care? Right? So, but I just use these examples. I just throw that to you. I really don't have an answer. Oh, sorry, do I, should I go back? Uh, okay. Now, this is a very touching story. This story that I really uh, feel I share the common um, feelings with uh, Jimmy's this morning. This is uh, two stories that uh, I, uh, as, uh, in the process of my new acquisition. And uh, the, uh, the pictures over my far side on your left is uh, visitors in the summer of 2017. I I, I, my colleagues and myself, two other ladies on my, uh, my left is, uh, is my colleagues. And we drove about one and a half hours from, uh, from Toronto, downtown Toronto, where the museum is, to the suburban areas, to his family, um, Pauline Reed and Susan Reed. Susan is a daughter of the, uh, uh, Pauline. Pauline is standing on my right. And they called me one day to say, you know, my, uh, my mom was appalling and uh, uh, will go to the nursing home. And there's a collection of Chinese uh, works and uh, artifacts. And uh, we really treasure so much. And we, we, we wonder whether the museum is interested about it. But she said in a very tone, in a hesitation, because she probably understand it is not like kind of like museum quantity. All right. So I went over there. I listened to the story. 
And uh, before I came hear the story, I already had different ideas about uh, what are we collecting, what the 21st century museum collecting. We are collecting not the quantity of the, muse uh, the, the artifacts anymore. We are collecting people's history. We are collecting the heritage. We are collecting memories of family. We bring those things to the museum. So I come with this concept and I listen to their stories. The story is about the, the Susan's grandparents, the Pauline's parents, uh, Fred, um, Reed, and Annie Reed, who met each other in 1920 on the boat of the uh, Young's River in the Three Gorges area, fell in love and married in China and spent three, uh, 30, decades, uh, 30 years uh, from the uh, 1920s to the 1949 in the west of China as a mission, as a missionary mission, as a, a Western China mission. And uh, they established a school, a Canadian school of Western China and becoming the uh, principals of there. And what I'm looking at here is the uh, uh, a texture, uh, waved textures of the uh, commemorating uh, scripts uh, calligraphy and uh, to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a gift to the departure of uh, Fred, of his father. And they come along with many other beautiful, you know, garments and, uh, you, you know, household utensils. It's, uh, and, 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 and Susan is the a principal of a public school. And the family kept about the letters, photographs for 30 years of that history of the family. And she wrote and published a, a book, narratives, about the grand, her grandparents' life in China. So they called it Journey in China. So I'm taking that and taking all the photographs and with this together and tell them, I'm going to take all of this with me and I'm going to take your family's history and memories with me. All right. And it's the same thing here briefly to see on this side. This is the picture of, uh, oops, I'm going back. And this is the picture taken in 1946. This is a Robert, uh, uh, Robert Sanders. And uh, her daughter and, uh, passed away a year ago and lived the estate to see whether the museum interested in these two pieces was sitting in their family for over last, you know, half a century. And uh, these two pieces, uh, a Chinese pieces, was given as a gift by this gentleman was sitting besides of the uh, Rob, Rob, oh, I forgot to tell you, Rob Sanders was a mayor of Toronto during 1943 to 1949. It was, he received a gift, uh, the uh, visit from Chinese Congress person. Chinese Congress person, the name is here, Mr. Zhang, Zhang Zitian, uh, associated with the uh, government of the Republic of China. It's, you know, on their missions or on the, something that I know, but in these letters only tell me that why the Mr. Zhang, the congressman, to like to present these two vessels. The one vessel, the red vessels, represents Chinese nation symbols. This is a high-end Chinese uh, art representations of the red vessels in the high quantities. And also the Buddha figures is a local, the Cantonese claim style of uh, uh, products of uh, uh, pottery making because this congressman represents Guangdong area. So those have been sitting in their family, and of course, uh, Rob Sanders has become the uh, president of uh, Ontario Hydro uh, before he retired and passed on to the daughters, and those things have now become at the drum. So when I received these tears, I find, wow, um, this is part of uh, the history of Toronto, the history of Canada, in relation, in the diplomatic relations with the uh, Chinese government in the 1940s. And the piece of history may not be able to record in any documents. We do not know archive that uh, what is mission of this congressman came to Toronto. We don't know, but it might be uh, issues can be, you know, explored to find out. My last story is, uh, is this, the two black and white pictures. The one on over there is, was uh, 
possessed by a descendant of uh, uh, American photographers in China who took these, likely took these photographs. Uh, I'm not 100% certain, but it's likely uh, he did because he gave, uh, the family gave the, uh, the museum uh, 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 10 volumes, uh, 10 albums of the collections of the uh, um, Chinese photographs that uh, being in the family by this photographer. And these two, uh, oops, this, these two uh, Chinese ladies in uh, for, in the studios in the Western settings, and we do not know who they are, what's their names, what the status is, where they have ledgers becoming uh, such a uh, uh, good life to taking the photographs in the uh, uh, in the Western studio uh, by a Western photographer, likely, and uh, um, um, what's in the location that they are taking that photographs. Well, we don't know. So, but that, but that photograph in the families for that long, as they are souvenirs in China. But we do know these couples and their story come with it. And I find it fascinating about knowing the stories and find out who tells the story. Is the museum tell the stories or the family tell the stories and what the stories they're telling is. It comes with a normal process of acquisition, the acquisition of these two beautiful or more beautiful garments of Chinese style of uh, uh, dresses was, uh, and that was belongs to uh, Louis Davis' mother, which is this lady, uh, Marine Russell. Her name is uh, Maria, uh, Maria Russell. And uh, her daughter is Louis uh, Davis. When she uh, went at her 80s, he came to Rome and said, would you be interested in my mom's beautiful, you know, the, uh, the garments. And uh, she's really where they treasured. She, you know, kept it with uh, memories of a stack of the letters and the photographs. Well, my textiles curators is uh, very interesting in the textile and she kept it textile but she came to my office say Trin, I don't want to have uh, I don't want I do not want the photographs and the letters do you want them because they're about China all right so I take the photographs this is the one of the 30 of them and uh, a stack of more than two dozens of the letters between uh, between this gentleman and uh, the ladies and uh, from Shanghai to Ontario, province Ontario, near Toronto somewhere. And uh, I'll come to that. And I look at, I read the letters, I look at the pictures, I say, wow, this is not about Chinese history, this is not about the love history about these two, these couples, this is not only about the Canadian history, this is all about them, all right? This gentleman, Peter Harris, about 20 years older than these ladies and they fall in love with each other, but they couldn't get married because he's too old for the ladies' family. So the ladies' parents would not allow that mass marriage is happening in the 1930s or 20s. And the Peter and the employee to buy a Canadian um, major insurance company called Sun Life, probably still hear about Sun Life Insurance. And they had a major branches in Shanghai and Peter took the CEO positions in the Shanghai branch of Sun Life in a Canadian uh, station. And he had a wonderful house, which is another picture, uh, shows he is in the front of the Shanghai house in the 250 Hongqiao Road. Well, when there's last year, and uh, the actual numbers is the house is gone, but the nearest house, 180, is the bank, the building there. And uh, he actually, because the difficulties of the family inter uh, interventions about their love affairs, so he continued to write, write, write letters with passion to tell me all the history about what happened in Shanghai. There's a war Japanese coming to the Shanghai now. And he even wrote letters from the uh, uh, intern in camps, internment camps, when he was you know, captured by the Japanese and he had to teach the uh, uh, English and uh, teach the uh, other kids how to, how to write uh, English uh, short stories of such things. But anyway, I have to make a long story short. I'm sorry, taking your time. And, but I just feel so touched. And there is a history behind that, but we, how we identify that culture and history is China or Canada or, or Canada. I got it. I got the uh, point. 
So that's my story, come to the end. Well, then I want to have uh, three questions right at you. So first of all, by global, uh, globalizing Chinese art, who are those arts? Well, Chinese art by the Chinese, uh, made by Chinese people or by the people living in China? And those are the, uh, uh, this is uh, Canadian Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, Canadian, Chinese Canadians authors that are living in Toronto and uh, who had uh, native Chinese who had ed educations, master's degrees in the in Indiana University and now making all the artworks, public works in Toronto as a world winnings, all kind of world winnings in Toronto, city of Toronto, uh, province and the federal grants. It's uh, by the panel of uh, recognitions by the panels of uh, uh, panelists of a Canadian artist. So when I ask her, her is your work like the one here suspended in the museum here? Is a Canadian art or Chinese art? And she would say, why you have to define my art as Canadian art or Chinese art? I do not know. I just make art for the water main uh, my, what the relevance of my communities. And of course, who curated it? And when we are receiving those art and how we you know, perceive of those uh, 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 artworks. This is a group of uh, we call the Curator of Asian Art, and uh, we are very, very interested to talk about it. We meet every year. We meet in uh, Mexico, Ten was missed that uh, uh, com conference. We talk about all these issues that we are facing, but one thing while we are try to do, we want to bridge in China, Korea, and, 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 and uh, uh, Japan together, but we all been told by our community say, we want Japan is Japan. We don't want Japan in China. We don't want Korea in Japan. And uh, I, I just give it that point and uh, move to the next one. But the other thing that we must, must be realized, you know, out in a different way, you have to look at it three, three ways. Art is a commodity, even though so many of our artists want to deny on that, but art is a commodity. And one commodity they are sold and they sell, and they sold and bought it, they transport it. And, uh, are becoming a product, a possession by a family, becoming a family, becoming a, a, a they, 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 they have a history. And all it is an identity because you can't uh, remove that identity away from that. So when I'm come to the end of this talk is what that really means to us. These three pictures on top, because when you're talking about globalization, you can mix it with the maps. And the map is the major province in the museum. All right. We don't want to get a political side of it, but you will always, when you are talking about engaged, engaged community, you will get questions about the border lines and when was us here. So you see there's the maps of China, maps of uh, uh, Korea, uh, Korea, but there's no map of Japan because Japan doesn't want to have the map in there, and they are replaced by the cherry flowers. Right. So what I was trying to try to make a point here, yes, the curators of the museums are really, look, you know, we're dealing with the global art. We are really need to be listen, act and react and justify and make relevance of those opinions and the voices of from global, you know, communities here and within the opinions from different way. So here, once again, as by talking about globalization, we really is moving from the cultural differentiations to a community engagement. By that, I mean you really have to build your identities, but you need an open mind to see the one, that, you know, in case of Chinese art, the Chinese art, it's not, it can talk more about, the, not only Chinese art talking about Chinese stories, Chinese histories, vice versa, there's other art Artworks of art can tell Chinese story, Chinese art, right? And that's how we want a museum to place those artworks in a community basis. Thank you very much. I just have to jump quickly. So it is my turn and my pleasure to follow up what uh, um, Chen, Shen just uh, discussed about uh, the sort of complexity of presenting the Chinese art in the global context. But before I do that, um, I would like to step back a little bit. You know, as an archaeologist, I always want to look back history. I want to reveal how the whole thing, what we call Chinese art, started. What's the formation process of what we call today China or Chinese civilization or Chinese art? As Chen mentioned, is there a Chinese art? Uh, how do you define that? 
in order to understand or to define that, you do need to look back into history uh, to see the process of how the Chinese art become Chinese art, or how Chinese civilization was formed. Everybody knows that the, the world was not isolated. Um, and China uh, is no exception. You know, over the many thousands of years of Chinese history, China was connected with many places. And China, as we understand today, um, uh, was not China in the past. So that's a very clear to archaeologists, historians. And it is this long process of interaction, connect, connectness, expansion of empire, or the divineness uh, of China by uh, foreign forces that all played um, important roles in the formation process of what we call Chinese art uh, today. So this is the historical context that you know, as a museum professional or as a scholar, you absolutely cannot ignore. And this long process, this long interregional process involves the flow of people coming both into China, leaving China, and also the treaty of commodities, um, and the flow of ideas, uh, the ideology, the beliefs, the religious, as well as techniques. Uh, so there's a two-way um, connection. Uh, people come into China, uh, China also expanded, and also uh, exported a lot of things to other countries. So this kind of Interregional uh, connectness uh, are the magnets uh, of what we call uh, the formation process of China. By the way, all the most of the uh, the the, uh, the artworks I, I'm showing you are from Denver Art Collection. So this museum, over the past hundred years, indeed uh, collect a lot of Chinese art. It's become you know part of the the the. Um, the important uh, sort of collection as well as the resources for us to understand how this art ended up in Denver. So this is a part of the process too. If you really want to go back to history, uh, you probably have to, um, as I'm an archaeologist. So I will tell you this story. So the, from the very beginning, um, the formation of the earliest Chinese civilization or earliest Chinese state is a process of the interregional interaction. It is interaction, or whatever you want to call them, within Chinese China, different regions, different cultures. They fight, they mingle, uh, they conquer each other, they learn from each other, that eventually formed the earliest Chinese civilization. And in this process, there are a lot of factors coming into China. Uh, not only from today's territory of China, but also beyond today's China's uh, political boundary. Uh, one of the examples is the metallurgy. Now, uh, for a long time, the Chinese archaeologists want to define that it is a indigenous uh, invasion. But now, with more evidence uh, from Central Asia, that many scholars recognize it is coming from West, from West of today's China. And this kind of technology fundamentally changed China, the early Chinese civilization. And the, uh, the you know, manufacture of all these bronze artifact 3,000 years ago, even in today's standard, we still consider them as masterpieces. People still reckon or recognize the sort of splendor of this uh, Chinese civilization. Another example is Buddhist. Everybody knows Buddhism is not invaded in China. But it came to China and fundamentally changed Chinese, not only Chinese, uh, the way the Chinese think about universe, but also the culture and the art itself. So whose art, if you want to ask whose art is this? It is in China, but the idea and the you know, philosophy, all the religion was not invaded in China but it's become part of the Chinese culture, a Chinese uh, art. The other perfect example is the ceramics. You know, uh, 
um, we talk about the global trade, and um, there's nothing than ceramics or porcelain that fundamentally changed the Western or the European perception of China. As a matter of fact, the English word China itself is porcelain. So it's become symbol of China. The export of Chinese porcelain ceramics to other parts of Asia, as well as to, to Europe, um, had a great impact uh, of all of these regions. Um, people try to imitate, try to learn, try to make uh, the similar um, um, porcelains. And, and China, the manufacture of Chinese porcelain inside China were also profoundly uh, affected by this kind of international market or international test too. Give you more example of how Chinese ceramics influenced European test. They were massively import or exported to Europe, started from 15th century, and they become the symbol of status or luxury items in Europe. They were used to decorate the king's palace. Of course, they were used to decorate the um, rich people or aristocratic families a ballroom like this one in, uh, in Dutch in the uh, uh, 17th uh, century. And even the ordinary people like this one. Um, um, and they, they're still very proud to, I couldn't figure out how do we do this. Um, um, some pieces together with their, you know, their utilitarian stuff um, in their kitchen. So it's become um, something they admire, and they like to display in their family to their friend. And it also become important component of the European art, particularly the Dutch art in the 17th century, the still life. That by showing that you have this luxury, exotic uh, Chinese porcelain, uh, you express the happiness of your life. In this case, the, 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 the Netherlands, uh, they, they sort of uh, all of a sudden they become rich because of the maritime trade with Asia. So it's become part of the, the, the European art, the art that define not China, but define the Dutch, um, uh, all the European identity. If, you, if we turn the direction and see how the Western influenced China, now there are many examples. One of is the early 20th century. You know, when China was awake and forced to do a lot of things that they don't want to do uh, with the Western powers, and so the Chinese uh, artists and intellectuals that want to learn, to embrace, to completely reform uh, the Chinese art. Uh, they think one of the reasons China fell behind was because of the uh, stagnance of the Chinese literary art. Um, Many of them went to Europe, to Japan to learn, uh, particularly Paris. Um, uh, you know, one of the leading artists is, is Xu Bei Hong. Uh, we did a show of this artist in Denver uh, a few years ago. Uh, he was a leading force that want to reform the Chinese art, want to learn from the European realism or classicism. And when he, and, uh, uh, the, ironically, when he was in Paris, this kind of style was al already outdated but he never became a fan of then emerging sort of a cubism or, 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 um, or um, uh, a fauvism, but instead he chose earlier uh, style. And because of his status in China, he, um, uh, uh, his idea, his style, uh, dominant Chinese art for more than half a century, uh, at least on the mainland China. A more recent example is the contemporary Chinese art. You know, a few of the panelists talk about uh, Wei Wei or other, piece, or other artists. That the whole thing started in the 1980s when China reopened the door um, to the West, to the international world. Uh, um, and all of a sudden, the Chinese artists are fascinated by all these crazy art forms that they never thought they were art. This is how the contemporary Chinese art started. They, they, they don't mind to learn the ideas and, um, and um, the styles, and they think that's the way to move forward. So it is fair to say that without understanding the global 
um, contemporary art, it is impossible to understand uh, the contemporary Chinese art. But after more than three decades, um, practice non-Chinese contemporary art, or if there is one, become a really a global force. And many artists that uh, I encounter or I work with refuse to call them Chinese artists. Uh, they said, I'm just artist. Uh, do not call me Chinese artists. Although they live in China, they work on Chinese materials. So this is a very interesting global phenomena, uh, phenomena that as a museum professionals, you know, we absolutely cannot ignore. We have to um, deal with these changes. So one of the practice, one of the projects I did, uh, Christoph uh, mentioned in the beginning, that is try to break down some of the traditional boundaries, as Chen mentioned that um, for Asian art, in the Western museums in particular, uh, you tend to put them in Chinese gallery, Korean gallery, Indian gallery, or uh, Japan gallery. Um, so I want to explore whether there is a different way we can present the Asian art, at least Asian art, um, from our own collection. And that's the exhibit we call Lincoln Asia. So the whole idea of this exhibit is not to identify or recognize our art as a particular country or culture or region, but rather we want to explore the connections among this art. We want to explore the resources, uh, the idea, where the place come from. So this is what this exhibit about. So we divide them into different sections. Uh, the first section explore the mutual inspiration. We put Chinese, Korean, Japanese, uh, all this you know, we, we, we have the original designation together. For instance, like this one. It looked like Chinese, but it's not. It's a Korean art. It was created by a Korean artist, but it reflect a Chinese subject, the Chinese bronzes. And uh, it was influenced by the Chinese antiquarianism and bronzes, but it has become a very important uh, sort of art style in Korea. Uh, in the 19th century. Well, of course, this gallery has many other pieces too. Uh, its pieces that we choose reflect some kind of cross-cultural or cross-regional uh, connections and the trade uh, that I just mentioned, ceramic, textile, um, that they were sold in the, in, the, in the historic time as commodity, it end up in other countries. People like, like today, you know, people buy things all over the world. It become their own property, it, 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 uh, it, it become the sort of associated with their life, um, uh, their history, just like Chen mentioned, a lot of gifts that are from you know, his, uh, his, uh, his donors. Uh, it's not only about Chinese art anymore. It's not about the pot. It's about the family who own them. So as a museum, I think we should recognize um, uh, these connections. And the ink art. Um, uh, this is this one is focused on from, uh, East Asia, China, Japan, and Korea. Um, to use ink to write and to paint uh, was definitely regarded probably the highest art in this region, and the mutually influenced in China. China, uh, uh, China, of of course, um, had a dominant uh, impact on Korea and Japan. But there are two ways. The Chinese artists also learned from Japan and Korea artists too. So we put them together to compare the styles, and people can appreciate how the artists inspire uh, each other. And of course, of course religion. Um, uh, Asia has Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam. You know, These are all um, uh, important. Uh, religions, and they all have uh, a long tradition of art, or what we call them art today. That how these uh, different regions in Asia influence each other. It's one religion or one branch of religion, but the, the paintings, the sculptures are very different. They reflect the local identity. A Chinese Buddha is very different from a Thai Buddha. 
but they are buildings. Um, so, so how do we recognize uh, this connection? So we put them together uh, as a, a, a Buddhist art or Islamic art or uh, Hindu art. So just to quickly summarize, I know the time is an issue, that, um, um, that you know, as a museum curator, uh, sometimes we have to face the reality that we all have a territory. You know, I'm the curator of Asian art. Um, uh, when I was in Francis, uh, San Francisco Asian Art Museum, we have um, 12 colleagues, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and um, um, Himalaya. Sometimes we, um, it's hard to figure out who can control what we have in the museum. But if we break down the, the, the boundary and then open to others, I think all of a sudden uh, our world is much wider. And we can explore more issues uh, in the museum and to, refl to reflect the complexity of how art become art and how this art end up in a Western museum like in the United States. So that's my brief uh, comment on the topic today. Thank you very much and thank you. Uh, I'm running out, of, running out of my one hour limit. So, um, um, do we still want a discussion? Um, does anyone have any questions? Before Can we have a light, please? Okay. Uh, we have what? what? Oh, okay. Thank you for uh, all of this. Um, I understand um, that uh, a lot of the uh, the grand art of the era ended up going from uh, mainland China to Taiwan uh, during the 40s. Um, I was wondering, as relations between those two places have thawed or normalized, if there's been more of a collaboration between those two neighbors um, and what the differences in their art communities are. Okay. Let me, let me, let me feel, say a few words. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, that's, um, um, that's a very important question, actually, although it's a difficult question. Uh, yes. Um, the split of the emperor's collection um, between mainland China and Taiwan was a result of the bitter civil war between the communists and the Kuomintang. Um, um, it is a historical fact, and it is still ongoing. Um, but that said, um, there has been a lot of uh, exchange between mainland China and Taiwan, mostly one, one direction. Uh, the mainland Chinese museums send a lot of their collection to Taiwan, and they love to show them. The Palace Museum in Taipei showed many art uh, from, from China. But, but there has been no uh, sort of examples, uh, or no exhibit that the Taiwan has sent to mainland China uh, for complicated reasons. But there, the, the Taiwan History Museum sent something back. Uh, so um, uh, it is political. It is beyond the museum people's control. And it also affects for people like me and uh, Chen in uh, this part of the world. We want to bring the the uh, imperial collection to the United States, um, you know, to, to North America. Um, um, and it is absolutely impossible to combine the two collections together. You either work with Beijing or work with Taiwan. And there is no way you can, you can, you can borrow pieces from both museums. So that's the sad reality of the, of the um, recent Chinese history. I'm not sure if you have any comment on that. Oh, I just want to add uh, really a secret behind the answer. You probably ask why they cannot put them together. Well, it's about identity. It's very political, it's identity. It's the, the Palace Museum in Taiwan called National Palace Museum in their 
museum title, but that cannot be really as a parallel to the Palace Museum from mainland China. And that is really a big secret and should not be a secret that they will never can go together side by side because n none of their side will give up the rights to see their positions. So it's very political uh, in this culture exchange. So that's n n nothing else that we can do. And uh, your museum probably are, are very lucky to have the collaborations from um, Palace Museum from uh, Taipei, even though you don't have uh, pieces from Beijing. But in Toronto, we worked so hard about we could have you know, any artifacts from the Taipei Palace Museum from Taiwan because uh, the uh, federal government of Canada doesn't issue uh, indemnification on a federal level, even though we have uh, in, you know, uh, indemnification uh, from Caesars, uh, immunity from Caesars, I'm sorry, in, immunity from Caesars at the provincial uh, law, but Taiwan doesn't really recognize that. So with that uh, bracket, we, we just couldn't have uh, fun. Uh,